of the students what they think about the different texts. On the web page, I pointed out that there was Weinberg, Weinberg quote, volume one, Heskin, Schroeder, and then there's a book by Srednicki, which is nice in some ways. There are two free books, probably more than two. The two I know of are by Siegel, Warren Siegel. That's a very hard book. I actually haven't tried to read it. I printed out 50 pages and took it home. I didn't get around to reading it. But it looked quite difficult. Then there's one by Alvarez, Gourmet, and an associate of his, which is much more accessible, also free. So what do you think? I don't know the difference between the books. I would have to defer to your expertise in choosing. All right. Well, in the past, I've used Manwood Shaw, Ramon. I can't remember the others. Then Weinberg's book came out, and I switched to Weinberg, and I taught out of Weinberg many times. The problem with Weinberg is that he's Weinberg, and he's just essentially infinitely smart, and he derives everything in complete generality from first principles. And it just means that there's just so much neural activity required to read the book. And moreover, it's so intense that in Volume 1, he doesn't get to non-being-engaged theory or grand implication or supersymmetry or various other topics. So I don't know. I think the best choice, the best choice, sit anywhere. The best choice, I think, is Peskin and Schroeder. But there's nothing wrong, as I said, there's nothing wrong with the other books, especially the free ones, which you can use as supplements. Anyway, I prepared the first lecture more or less out of Peskin and Schroeder. Let me say globally one thing that what I'll try to do is I'll try to take some insights from Weinberg and add them in. Some of the insights from Weinberg are fairly simple and clear. For example, he takes as a point of view that we know something about particles and how particles transform under rotations and lorings. I think we want that open. Hello? Why don't we have that open to have ventilation? It's, you know, we have to freeze. So Weinberg's view is that we know something about how particles transform under rotations and lorings transformations. So they're the fundamental thing. He defines creation and annihilation operators in terms of the particle states and then creates fields of creation and annihilation operators. And he knows how the fields transform because he already figured out how the creation and annihilation operators transform under rotations and lorings transformations. Those rotations are lorings transformations. So that is, that's to be kept in mind. That's the, I think, the correct view. The Peskin and Schroeder take a slightly different point of view, not that they deny what Weinberg said. 
I brought in a little bit of candy here. As usual, um, I use candy to uh, reward students who ask questions. <laughs> um, uh, I still remember the, um, your, your first question, uh, which was what kind of chocolate. <laughs> All right, so um, I'm going to try to lecture with ordinary chalk, but um, if you guys have trouble seeing it, uh, let me know and I'll go back to my office and get big chalk. The big chalk being much bigger and easy to see. All right, well, the, the, the first issue is why we, why we want to have quantum field theory rather than ordinary um, quantum mechanics. The, the reason, in a nutshell, is that if you, if you measure the position of a particle precisely, well, precisely is, if you try to measure it precisely, you're going to need uh, particles, uh, for example, photons of higher and higher momentum and, I mean, shorter and shorter wavelength, therefore higher and higher momentum. And eventually these photons are going to create other particles. And so then you're not sure what particle it is that you, that you measure. So there's real limitation to, to, uh, to, to measuring position and, in fact, um, when you bring relativity into quantum mechanics, you automatically get particles created. That is to say, if the energy of the photon exceeds twice the mass of the particle you're measuring, then, uh, what can happen is that instead of one particle, you wind up with three. And, uh, and so there's particle creation. Heston and Schroeder take the view that um, xt, if you have a particle, in non-relativistic quantum mechanics, at time zero at x zero, then at time t, it has an amplitude of being at x given by x e to the minus h t x zero. And I'm going to be setting h bar equal to c equal to one. These are natural units. Um, what you do is you do the calculation in natural units. And then when you want to get back to standard SI units, what you do is you just take a look at your answer and then you sprinkle on top of it enough factors of H bar and C as to get the unit right. And that um, brings, uh, brings you to, uh, that's the way you get back to SI units. A simple example would be if your answer is M and you want an energy, then you multiply by c squared, and that's the thing in the standard units. Okay. Um, or if you want, a, a, if you have a, a length and it's 1 over p, and you want to know what that is, well, then you just multiply by h1. So that's that. All right. So, um, this then in uh, is minus i uh, p squared over 2m t on x0 and after a little bit of uh, uh, of a calculation this turns out to be m over 2 pi i t to the 3 halves e to the i m x minus x zero squared over two t. Okay, so that's so what you see here is that you've got effectively an amplitude, a non-zero amplitude for the particle to move um, faster than the speed of light. In other words, you could have x minus x zero squared greater than t squared. The space factor would not be minus infinity; it would be some imaginary number, and so you get a violation of um, special relativity. Because that's not surprising in as much as you're using non-relativistic kinematics. 
if you change and you use relativistic kinematics, then you have xt, x0 is x, and if we, we, we use e to the minus i t square root of p squared plus m squared, x0, then after a lot, and I'm not going to go through the details here, 1 over pi squared x minus x0, um, integral 0 to infinity p sine p x minus x0, uh, e to the minus i t squared root of p squared plus m squared dp, and this goes as e to the minus m square root of x squared minus t squared. So this is better because you use relativistic kinematics, but you still get a finite violation of relativity, although one that's exponentially small as x squared exceeds t squared. By the way, those of you who have looked at Peskin and Schroeder may notice that I've skipped chapter one. Skip, chapter one is um, kind of an entertainment. It's something you should read, but um, uh, you're not supposed to work through it in detail. It's just this is something that uh, is, is um, sort of background about going to a colloquium. Any questions? We have chocolate. <laughs> um, I should mention that, of uh, course, one of the problems is that Peskin and Schroeder have p squared as p0 squared minus p vector squared, which is m squared. Weinberg and Shrednicki have p squared equal to, well, and I might as well add uh, um, Finland, p squared equal to p vector squared minus p zero squared equal to minus p squared. So um, in order to minimize the problems of using Peskin and Schroeder, I'm going to use the Peskin and Schroeder metric. Um, the big advantage of it is that very often in particle physics calculations you see p squared and because it's something squared you think it's positive and so it is for the case of uh, this metric. Um, on the other hand, when you're doing general relativity, you expect x squared to be positive and if it's x squared minus p squared then it kind of is. And so anyway, um, so there's a natural predisposition to go in one direction or the other depending on what the subject is. On the other hand, um, I think Weinberg chose this metric because after all, you get three plus signs and one minus sign, and in the other case, three minus signs. I put the first class notes on the web and if we continue to video the lectures, then the lectures will be on the web. Um, I don't know. I suppose that's an advantage, but I don't know. So I, so I guess we're at a stage where there isn't really a terrible question at this point. Um, all right, I'm going to jump now to something. Oh, Although I'm going to be following chapter two now of Peskin and Schroeder, I'm, I'm not going to follow in absolute det detail because, you know, then you could just, just read the book. Um, I'm going to try to add a few things. And one is something that is always, something that is almost never covered in courses in mathematical methods and then never explained in courses in field theory. And that's the functional derivative. And so I thought I'd tell you what a functional derivative really is. And I'm going to confess something to you. I learned this in Wikipedia. <laughs> um, 
There are a lot of good things on Wikipedia. Not just uh, the, the new Pentagon thing. But, um, anyway. All right. So let's um, let's let's let me first. Um, all right. Well, I'll, I'll just do it as an example instead of. Uh, Let's consider the action. The action is an integral of a Lagrange density, P4 of x, that's over space and time. And the Lagrange density, in the simplest case, is a function of the field and the derivatives of the field. Here, the partial P, partial x, upper mu, is written as d lower mu of phi. It's sometimes written as phi comma mu. Those are all three notations. The advantage of using more compact notation is that it, there, there really is a big advantage. Somehow the neurons get loaded up processing the visual information. And if you have too detailed a notation, um, pretty soon the uh, all the ATP in the brain is used up processing these, these symbols, and there's nothing left for the concept. All right, so let me say what, um, let me use a sort of mathematical notation. This, oh, let me first of all mention something. The action, the Lagrangian, Lagrange density, that's L is a function of phi and d mu phi. But the action, S, is an integral of that function. And so it's said to be a functional of phi. So this is, so to speak, S of phi, square bracket meaning that it's a function of a function, the function being the field phi. And of course, in general, what you have is not just one field, but you have several fields, and they're not all spin zero fields like phi, which is what we're going to start with, but for spin one half and spin one and spin two and so forth, spin three halves. Um, in fact, one of the embarrassing things about physics is that on field theory, as normally taught, is kind of based on a model of a spinless scalar field, and this is the one thing that has not been observed. That is to say, there are no elementary particles that have been observed that correspond to a spin zero field. The Higgs is probably out there lurking in Geneva somewhere, um, but uh, hasn't yet been observed. Maybe in Chicago. Somewhere. All right, so let me say what, what this thing is. The functional derivative is a functional of a functional in a sense. So let me just define it. It's d by d epsilon of s of phi plus epsilon h at epsilon equal to zero. So this is one way, at least, of defining this functional. And the physics notation here is the functional derivative uh, like this. So the physics notation is, is this functional derivative. And what it really is in language that you can understand as you, you sort of, I think when graduate students see this in a normal course of quantum field theory, most of them stare at it like a rabbit looking at a snake. And um, I think I heard that first from um, an Irish theorist by the name of Lachlan O'Rafferty. Um, I was just striking him. He wasn't talking about dragons. <laughs> All right, at any rate, this is what um, the functional derivative uh, is. In other words, so you have a functional of phi, you change phi by adding to the field phi of x 
epsilon, a small number, times h of x. S, the function will match that into a number. So this is then a function of epsilon. You differentiate, and that's your functional derivative. And so, for example, in this particular case where that is the uh, Lagrangian, this then is d by the epsilon of an integral L of phi plus epsilon h d mu phi plus epsilon d mu h d4 x epsilon equals zero. And now, since epsilon is small, we expand this and drop everything but uh, but um, linear terms, and so this is just. Uh, L plus epsilon partial L partial phi times H plus partial L partial D mu phi epsilon D mu H D fourth X epsilon equals zero. Now it's pretty easy to do the differentiation. What is h here? h is just, at the moment, an arbitrary function of x. But in, in physics notation, what we do is we then replace h by a Dirac delta function. So in other words, the general function of is then, um, in fact, still a functional. It's uh, partial L partial phi times H plus partial L partial D mu phi, D mu phi, no, D mu H, sorry. Now what we do is, um, well, we're going to imagine that this H is um, looks like that. In other words, it has compact support. In other words, it's zero outside a certain region. And in particular, a delta function is an ideal example. And so we can do one more step here. We can say this is partial L, partial phi, integrating by part d mu of partial L, partial d mu phi, h, d fourth x. And we can drop the surface term because uh, h is localized in space. What with this horrible chalk and this um, un unwashed board? Um, I, can you guys read that? I mean, I, I realize you're 50 years or so younger than I am, so you can um, see much better. Uh, is, that all right? is that all right? Because I could go I can read it. it. I, can huh? read. I can read it. You're six feet away. <laughs> John, can you read? I am good. I can do that. It's like 20 feet away. Yeah. Actually, this summer I was closer than that to a moose. Um, I was visiting my youngest son in Anchorage, and uh, one of the first days we were there, we went for a walk on a cloudy day in the park in Anchorage. We saw six moose, and one of them was about as far away as the camera. Um, it was a male moose. I had heard that male moose were only dangerous in the fall. So I asked people, what do they know it's July? <laughs> it's, it's actually, you know, was serious. Uh, a, a physics professor was trampled to death by a moose in Anchorage. Recently, I 
was he doing playing field series? What I was told, I heard this from Jim Thomas, who is a friend of the chairman of that department. And apparently the moose was between the physicist and the board of the physics building. And the physicist thought, well, he sort of just scrunched by the moose rather than go around and use some other door. I presume he turned it in several doors. And was the moose trampled to death? They're big, stupid animals. Okay, so this H is arbitrary here, H of X. And I'm going to set H of X equal to, well, it's T fourth of X minus Y. And in that case, this is partial L partial V minus D mu partial L partial D mu V. All at Y. And so that basically is what physicists call the variational derivative with respect to the field at the space-time point of Y. So this is the bottom line. But as I said, I've never seen, in fact, I've never seen anywhere a treatment, a sensible treatment of the functional derivative except, as I said, in Wikipedia. By the way, I don't know, I guess some of you know that I've been writing a book on mathematical methods for physics graduate students. And it's now about 560 pages in PDF form. And if you want to look at it, you go to the website bio.phys.unm.edu slash 466 and you click on here. Here are the notes. Here are the class notes. And in particular, chapter, I don't know, 16 or so is on functional derivatives. So if you want to get more on functional derivatives, you can either go to chapter 16 there or you can wiki it. Is there a question? No. But it's good to ask me the question because then everybody hears the answer. I just got confused for a second. I was wondering how we ended up with the delta S, delta S, delta P when we started with the delta, with the D, the epsilon. But now I see that that was the definition. So to recapitulate what he just said, it's that the definition, this is a functional. The variation derivative is a functional of a functional. Yeah, a double functional in a sense. It's defined as this derivative of the functional. And you wind up with this if you choose as your test function in a sense. H of X, the delta function, delta 4 of X minus Y. Are there any restrictions on what H of X can be? Oh, I think if you're doing a general functional derivative, H of X is arbitrary. And then your answer is this. But, and of course, you know, if you're in a space of 37 dimensions, then you wouldn't choose delta 4 of X minus Y. Sure, you'd use delta 37. All right, so any other questions? All right. So what is the physical motivation that you choose the delta function? Physical motivation. I don't think there is any physical motivation. No, but you said mathematical motivation. But you said for physical problems. We're wearing the same shirt. All right. Thank you. Thank you.
Basically, you have um, in quantum mechanics, QP is I, and what we're going to change that to is basically phi of x, pi of y is I delta Q of x minus y, at least for a, um, this is in Schrodinger picture. More generally, it's phi of x and t, pi of y and t, pi of x minus y. Now, um, so I'm going to 
illustrate how this goes. Um, four spin zero. And students get the impression sometimes that that you can go from the spin zero to spin one half or spin one and so forth smoothly. In fact, um, it's anything but smooth. Going from zero to one half, you go from commutation to relation to anti-commutation relations. When you go to gauge field, you have um, just an absurd situation where, um, well, it's reflected in this book, in the, in the Peskin Schroeder book, by Peskin and Schroeder saying after they've quantized spin zero and spin one half, they say, well, we're not going to quantize spin one. We'll postpone that until we do half of it. And um, Weinberg's view is to quantize the electromagnetic field in um, what's called Coulomb gauge or radiation gauge, and, um, and then argue that. Theory is still relativistically invariant, and in fact, um, you can rewrite the theory in a relativistically invariant way when you do the Feynman diagram calculations. Um, I think that's the so that's a legitimate way of doing it. I mean, that's the best way of doing it. Um, the Mandel Shaw approach. Okay, so let's see. What what is this pi? Well, uh, in ordinary mechanics, the momentum is the derivative of a Lagrangian with respect to q dot. And um, here, one can have pi. One can think of it in various ways. One is you can say, well, it's just the ordinary derivative of the Lagrange density with respect to phi dot. So that's one uh, perfectly good approach. Another is to say, well, pi is actually the variational derivative with respect to p dot. And so this is then d by d epsilon. And then we have the Lagrangian of p grad c. And then we've just changed p dot by p dot plus epsilon h t four x, and um, this turns out to be, of course, to be partial L partial p dot uh, epsilon h t d epsilon t four x. So this is partial L partial p dot h t four x, and then as you replace you let h of x minus y into delta of x minus y of the fourth in this case, then pi of, um, say, y and t is then partial L partial pi dot um, evaluated on y and t. So however you want to do it, that's what um, And then um, um, in mechanics, what you have is again the simplest case of mechanics. You have pi i q i dot minus l. Well. What we're going to do is we're going to say that qi is going to be phi at x, and pi is going to be pi at x. And we're going to think of each point of space as a uh, quantum system. And um, just as h is this, our actual quantum Hamiltonian then is going to be an integral pi pi dot minus l d cubed x. So any, any questions? All right, now 
In the simplest case, L is a half, phi dot squared minus rad phi squared minus m squared phi squared. This is in the simplest case. And when all we write this as du phi, du phi minus m squared phi squared. And notice it's a little tiresome to write this. And so people get lazy and they write du phi squared. What they mean is, what they mean by this is that. Okay, well, so let's take this as an example and look at our Lagrange's equations, which are these. And see what we get. Of course, we can see this before several times. Most of you would say you won't be surprised. The partial of Lagrange density with respect to du phi is, of course, d upper mu phi. There's a little subtlety here. If you're differentiating with respect to this guy, well, you get one half times this guy. But then you just lower this one and raise that one and differentiate with respect to the second one. That gives you another factor. And so you get two terms which cancel the one half. Is that sort of clear? So this, I mean, when you're taking a derivative with respect to, obviously, respect to du phi, that has a coverage in it somewhere that we're going to raise and lower indices when we take that derivative? So the point is, this is the thing we're differentiating. Now, if you're differentiating with respect to d lower mu phi, then obviously you get one half d upper mu phi. But if you're differentiating with respect to d lower mu phi, you're really also differentiating with respect to d upper mu phi, just with the suitably lowered index or raised index. So in other words, because there were two of them, the square cancels the two, and this is what you get. So you can multiply by the metric and maybe lower it or whatever. That's even better. That is, here, you get a candy bar. That's a better way of saying it. All right, so let's use his interpretation is what we have here is eta. Let me see, what do we want to differentiate? So we say eta mu nu d mu phi d mu phi. So this is another way of writing this thing. That we will want to have. Now when we differentiate or to make it perfectly, let's call this rho nu rho like that. Then the derivative of this with respect to d mu phi is, well, if rho is equal to mu, then it's one half eta mu nu d mu phi. And then if nu is equal to mu, it's one half eta rho mu d rho phi. And so the two together give you, in other words, this is one half phi mu plus one half phi mu, which is just phi. Sorry, this is d mu phi plus one half d alpha mu phi, which is just d mu alpha. All right, so that's, thank you. That's a much better way of saying it. Okay. All right, so Lagrange's equation then is that the 
derivative of this, namely du of du t, is equal to partial L partial t, which in this case is minus m squared v squared. And so the equation then is du du t plus m squared t is zero. This is sometimes written as box plus m squared t equals zero, and sometimes written as t2 dt squared minus the Poisson plus m squared t equals zero. So these are three different ways of writing what's often called the Klein-Gordon equation. Okay, so now we imitate classical mechanics. We say pi is the partial of L with respect to pi dot, and so pi is just, in this case, pi dot. And so equivalently, pi dot is pi, and we go to the same H as an integral pi pi dot minus L dt x, and so this is an integral of pi squared minus, and now we write L in terms of pi, so it's L minus a half pi squared minus grad pi squared minus m squared pi squared dt x, and these pi's cancel to some extent, and so you get all together a one half out in front, pi squared plus grad pi squared plus m squared pi squared dt x. So this is the Hamiltonian in this case. Now, I mentioned various books. One of them has some advantages. It's a book by Anthony Z called The Quantum Field Theory in a Nutshell. The problem with that book is that it's a really great book for people who have already had a course in quantum field theory. For example, it completely skips canonical quantization, which is sort of what we're doing now. But it has many insights in it, and it's quite pedagogical in the kind of... But what he does is he kind of jumps from topic to topic, and he jumps from one topic that he can treat clearly to another topic that he can treat clearly without really worrying about integrating everything. But one thing that he mentioned that I thought was quite nice was he compares a field to a mattress. And the idea is that you've got these... You've got a Q here, and so you'd expect Q dot squared. I'm just sort of doing this energy, and I'm leaving out factors of two and everything. So you'd expect Q dot squared term, and then you'd expect some sort of a Q, and you'd sum over positions, so an X here. And over here, this would be QX minus QY squared. In other words, that might be the height of the mattress at point X and point Y. And you see that as you go to the limit of infinitely many points, this turns out to be basically an integral of Q dot squared plus 
And this is effectively grant Q squared. And then you might have some other term that's some of the higher terms, F of Q, V of Q. So you might have a higher term. So this, in other words, motivates the gradient term as being a difference of the, say, heights of the mattress at neighboring points. And saying that that's where this comes from. One amusing thing about this, actually, is that if you take that point of view and don't add anything, then what you wind up with is a massless theory. In other words, no mass term. And curiously, the actual standard model starts out with all the particles massless. And they all get their mass through what's called the Higgins mechanism. That is to say, the particles get their mass by their interaction with the scale of field. Whether it's true or not is another matter. It may be resolved in the next five years or in Geneva. But anyway, it's so curious. The mattress model kind of goes in that direction. All right. Any questions? Because I'm about to start another time. Let me tell a quick story. I think students need anesthesia after hearing me lecture for more than ten minutes. I've been reading a book. Normally, I know almost no history. I've been reading a book called 1066. And it turns out that at that time, in 1066, actually in England, there was this guy, Edward the Confessor, who may have been a model or one of the models that Shakespeare used for Hamlet. Anyway, it was Edward the Confessor. And then there was a guy, and he died. And then suddenly on, I don't know, the 1st or 2nd of January of 1066. And then the Witan, which was the sort of effective parliament in the year 1066 in England, appointed Harold. And at this time, over in Normandy, France, there was William the Bastard, who also was known as William the Conqueror. And what happened was Edward the Confessor actually liked William the Conqueror, William the Bastard. And he, in fact, liked a lot of the French nobility and often invited them to England and vice versa. And he may have promised William that inasmuch as he, Edward the Confessor, had no children, that William would be the next king of England when he died. Whether that's true or not, nobody really knows. Anyway, Harold apparently went either hunting or fishing or something, certainly fishing, well, either hunting or fishing. And he was sailing back home, and he was caught in a storm. He wound up in France, but not in the dukedom of William the Bastard, but in the adjacent dukedom. And that duke said, ah, an English, a wealthy Englishman, and he took all his possessions, his boats and everything, and put them in prison. And William the Bastard then released, asked this duke to release Harold. And Harold apparently was so grateful that he promised William that he would try to get William named king of England when Edward the Confessor died. This is what I just described happening in 1051. Anyway, the reason I bring this up is that because what happened was that William the Bastard was really annoyed when the Witan nominated Harold as the new king of England. And 
fact he was, he felt as though he would lose face if he didn't invade England and be back on the continent. Um, and what I bring up is that just think in terms of chaos theory. In other words, sometimes, you know, people say, um, what if I slap its wings and then there's a storm somewhere else as a, as a remote consequence of what if I slap its wings? Well, in this case, the consequence of the storm was that William the Conqueror had invaded England in 1066 and um, had a huge effect on English history and French history. All right, well, so much. Four minutes. But actually, what's the story I meant to tell? I meant to tell a different story. <laughs> All right. Um, there's somebody by the name, there was a famous physicist by the name of, or mathematician by the name of Emmy Noper, and I don't remember how to spell Emmy. It's a Y. It's a Y. Yummy. <laughs> 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 All right. In any event, Ms. Murtha um, made some very nice observations, which were by and large uh, ignored until, I remember when I was a graduate student, they were kind of rediscovered. Somebody in Princeton found them, and then was coming to people at Harvard. I remember, uh, I remember when the news just got to Harvard. Anyway, all right, so, but she worked this out in the 19th century or the early 20th century. Okay, so uh, suppose we um, replace phi by phi prime, which is phi plus epsilon, and then some possible function of the fields phi. And the L prime is either invariant or it changes by a total divergence. And the nice thing about a total divergence is that it doesn't uh, affect the equations of motion. In other words, if we go back to, um, let's see, suppose we went back here and we changed, we put in a total divergence here. Well, what would happen is that um, we just get a surface term. And so, in fact, you can see that even from this, that the, the action S prime is equal to S plus some sort of a surface integral of um, T dot ds, where this is a sort of four-dimensional integral around the surface. And what you normally assume is that this T um, goes to zero at infinity spatially, and that it, it's the same but it either goes to zero at the far future and far past or whatever. In any event, it does, certainly doesn't affect the equations in motion. It can, um, it can be that S prime is different from S because of the, because of the surface integral, but in any case, we call it a, that the um, variational derivative was always in terms of an H that was localized in space. And so the T, which um, the, the divergence of T, which integrates to the surface term, wouldn't affect the equation too much. All right, so let's see what happens if we have both this symmetry. So this is a, this is the symmetry of the equations of motions. Possibly, in fact, often it's a symmetry of the Lagrange density. In, many, in the case of internal symmetries, it's a symmetry of the Lagrange density. Internal symmetries being you rotate one, you rotate one set, of, you rotate the fields into linear combinations of themselves. Or for example, in the simplest case, you take the field phi, a complex field phi multiplied by E B I theta, call that phi prime. If um, the field only involves the absolute value of phi or the absolute value of the derivatives of phi, then this is the symmetry. I'll give examples of this. All right. So we have a symmetry 
either of the Lagrange density or of the equations of motion or, uh, or this kind of a symmetry of the action or the Lagrange density, let's say. Um, and we're, we're, we're assuming that uh, the equations, we're, we're going to enforce the equation of motion. And so, well, let's see what actually happens. Well, what we have then is epsilon t mu t mu. This is the change in L. This is delta L. L prime minus L. But then that is going to be, in the simplest case, partial L partial T times, let me see, what was my notation? The change in phi, which is epsilon L phi, plus partial L partial T mu phi, the derivative of epsilon L phi. And of course, epsilon here is typically a constant, so the derivatives don't affect epsilon. All right, so this is in epsilon dl d phi, change in phi. And now we rewrite this thing as the derivative, as epsilon, the derivative of the whole thing, which is to say partial L, partial d mu phi, delta phi, and then minus uh, epsilon delta phi, the derivative of partial L, partial d mu phi. Okay, well you notice that this term cancels this term because of the equation of motion. So this means then that epsilon d mu t mu, which is the change in L, is epsilon d mu partial L partial d mu t delta t. Okay, well this means we have a nice conserved term. And the conserved current then is the J mu, which is delta phi, partial Lagrange density with respect to the mu theorem of phi, minus T mu. So this is the conserved current, which is to say zero is D mu J mu. So that was Emmy Nofa's observation. Uh, I don't know what she was working on, but anyway, she came up with this, and um, it's been very, very important uh, in the last 50 years in part of the um, high energy physics field theory, quantum field theory. So this is the sign of a conserved current. The reason why the thing is What's conserved? Well, it's, it's the J0 dot plus the divergence of J is zero. And so if you define
So um, what's what's conserved in this conserved current? Well, in particular, a charge which is J zero D two dense. This is conserved in the sense that the time derivative of that would be the integral of the time derivative of J zero, and then by this equation, that's minus the divergence of J, and then this is an integral J dot dS over the surface at infinity. And then, as in all physics experiments, there's no funding left to have J non zero at infinity, so this is zero. Especially with the Republicans <laughs> having 41 votes in the Senate. So this is effectively zero. So that's the sense in which um, the uh, any, any questions? Is that the same saying that the current J is localized somewhere in space? You could always choose a large enough surface. Well, yeah, I mean, we'd say that, uh, in other words, in order for Q dot to be zero, you need to say that you need to say that this integral at infinity is zero. Uh, and you can say it you know, any way that you want. I mean, the true statement is that Q dot is actually this. Whether it's zero or not, one usually takes it. So let's um, let me give an example of this. Is there a question? Um, I'm going to chew up four minutes for a question. Is a question? Hello. Let's do an example. I'll do an example. Okay. I think I'm going to go with this board because I don't have much time. It's darker. The class web page, of course, is the same thing by 523 instead of 466. And I put today's lecture notes and part of Wednesday's lecture notes um, on the web page. All right, well, let's say that 5 prime is dij 5j, where we're summing over j. One to n, whatever, however many fields are. Um, and suppose this is a symmetry that L of phi prime, du phi prime, and now we have an index on that, is equal to L of phi. Okay, so suppose it's actually a symmetry of Lagrange density, which is often the case. This is called an internal symmetry. And in the sense of um, in the standard model, SU2, SU2 left plus U1 is an internal symmetry. SU3 of color is an internal symmetry. Okay, these are internal symmetries. In this case, uh, T mu is zero. And what is J mu? Well, J mu is d phi, say, i, partial L, partial d mu phi i. And so this is partial L, partial d mu phi sub i, dij phi j. So this is the conserved current. So we, and of course, we have a sum here. In fact, this, in a sense, is the most general internal symmetry because you can always take complex fields and regard them as complex combinations of real fields. On the other hand, the easier way to deal with, if you really do have complex fields, 
then the easier way to think about it is to say phi i, phi i prime is di j. So these now are complex fields, psi. And psi i star prime is di j star psi j star. And here I'm summing over the repeated index. And then j mu is equal to partial L partial d mu psi i d i j psi j plus partial L partial d mu psi i star d i j star psi j. So that's the conserved current in that case. And the example we can now just have a few seconds more. The example in the case of the conserved current is this j mu j mu is zero. An example is L equals a half d mu psi star d mu psi minus a half m squared psi squared. In this case, psi prime is e d i theta psi. Psi star prime is e to the minus i theta psi star. In other words, here I've regarded psi and psi star as independent variables, which is an easy way of dealing with a complex case. And then you have the j mu. Applying this, you have j mu is i theta psi d mu psi star minus i theta psi star d mu psi. So this is the example in the PNS. All right. Well, that's certainly enough. Yeah. Oh, my God. I wish you would ask earlier. Epsilon del phi is a common term. And the other two combine, and they form Lagrange's equation. That is to say, zero is partial L partial P minus partial mu of partial L partial D mu P. Okay. That's a key point for us. All right. So as I said, I think you should read Chapter 1 of Lesson Charter as an entertainment, as a cultural experience, and then read Chapter 2 as a 